Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Belmont Saga, Part 2, Chapter 26, The H-R-N. So last week, we see Paymaster Stenstrom getting hoodwinked to some extent by the captain of the sandwich, Lieutenant Dunkster of Planetfall. Dunks, who's clearly operating a side venture on the sandwich, which may or may not be legal, appears that it is illegal, thinks that a very programmable, very wealthy, very connected guy like Paymaster Stenstrom shouldn't really be on the uh, ship like the sandwich, and he really shouldn't be a flippin' dippin' poopy doopy paymaster a, a clerk a civilian clerk he ought to be in the fleet on a warbird someplace near his dad lord stenstrom the elder yes nepotism is a thing in the league that's just the way that it is and he's like well he's gotta be working for somebody he's gotta know something and i'm gonna find out what it is and i've got who knows how many old Aaron wives and the Aarons, as we found out last week, are a fearsome sect of dirty courtesans which who use the weed, and the weed is a fungus from Brenval that when applied to select areas can has a psychotropic effect when it touches bare skin and can really knock the the pleasures of a sexual encounter to new heights. And the, the errands from Planetfall are the best at it. And they are well known as, and well feared, rightly so, as interrogators. As they are, they are often in the employee of this lord and that lord, this potentate and that potentate. Some of them work for the fleet. Some of them work for the sisters. Actually, the, well, the sisters can dig out information on their own, but they do have a few. And... Some of them work for Zaffins, you, you, you never know. They're just really good. And if you have a secret, they can fuck it right out of you. There's nothing you can do about it, basically. They just screw you until you talk. And they can implant suggestion, put, implant information into your head. They can program you like a flipping robot. And Dunks, well, this red weed, the red eye weed, that the errands make use of makes their eyes glow red also has a very deleterious effect upon their bodies it, it wears them out makes them old and people don't get old in the league but this weed just kind of withers them up and then once they're to a certain point doesn't really matter who they are within the Aaron sect they're kicked out and basically left to fend for themselves and dunks makes it a habit to find these old broken down errands marry them and has them in ports all over the fleet and he he, he gives them money not very much as lady christiana here on planetfall on z and car planetfall was living in squalor with their children and dunks doesn't really care about these women that he's married and has had children with he has no idea how many children he has but it's a lot but before arriving at Z and Car, he gets Lady Christiana, who's blind and whose hands look like the hands of a, of a dead woman because of the, the weed, calls her up and says, hey, I'm going to send you this guy and I want you to get out of him what he knows. And I want you to get out of him who he is working for. And if you have to screw him until he dies, that's fine. And so he tells Stenstrom, I want you to send some you know i have this money bag and i'm late and my wife and my kids here and i don't even know how many i got i don't even know their names need this money to survive and stenstrom being um you know he's he's becoming much more worldly as the as the section wears on but he's still a little naive and he's he's a nice guy and he says okay i'll, I'll make the drop for you and he goes over there and christiana of planet fall dunks his wife is a very enchanting lady uh, Stenstrom 
sees the the poverty that she lives in but she he sees how hard she's working trying to deal with her and she's basically blind as well she can see a little bit but not that much but she's getting on well and she's a good mom to their kids and is a loving mother and a doting mother and he he finds favor with that and he decides you know i'm, I'm gonna treat her like she deserves to be treated i'm gonna take her out on the town i'm gonna buy her some a replacement washer and dryer basically because she was using basically an old wa uh, manual wash bin that she you know rubbed the clothes on the on the bin and got them clean and he also opened a bank account for her and he's gonna deposit a little money that would really help her out every month and he did this because he wanted to and with no expectation of repayment or recompense and Christiana after saving him from a soul devourer attack lays it all out he says hey i was i was here i was supposed to question you my 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 husband wanted me to find out who you're working for and what you know but you know screw him you know you came here and you were such a nice person and you you made me you gave me my some of my dignity back and so they they do have sex and it's in absolutely incredible and he he finds an affinity with christiana of planet fall and in other books she was going to show up from time to time that she would send Stenstrom, you know, the report cards of her kids and pictures and all kinds of stuff, you know, keep, to keep her and her children on his mind. And maybe maybe he would like to return and, and strike up a relationship with her. She, she divorces, she divorces Dunks, you know, get your butt out of here, Dunks. It never really happened. I, I could never quite fit it into the books. You know, they would make it too bloated, slow to plot down too much. So she's still out there. And he still, he sends her money every month like he promised. It's no sweat off his rich, rich brow, I, I guess. But to uh, Christiana, it means a lot. And it helps her, live, you know, get out of the horrible tenement she was living in, move into a nicer area of the city, and raise her children better. So, here we are. Chapter 26. We have two more to go, and then we're out. And if I, if I keep harping on this chapter, it's, you know, I probably would have done things differently if I were to do this all again, you know, I, I I guess I've had it beaten into me that plot is king. And there's really no plot. Well, there is, there's, the story is progressing, but the main plot of getting the brandy to Baz aboard the depowered haunted seeker is in, been in idle for about 200 pages. We're almost done. We get this chapter, chapter 26, the HRN, and as you remember from the beginning of the book, Stenstrom was wearing this beautiful coat with HRN riveted on the side. The, admiral the admirals and the admirals sanctum hated it and got thrown fruit at him, blah, blah. So here in this chapter, we're going to see where that HRN came from. And then after that, we will have two more chapters to go. And then we are back in the Seeker and the plot will get revved up into high gear. So let's proceed immediately. Part 2, Chapter 26, the HRN, and let's see what this chapter has in store for us. Where in the name of creation have you been? Captain Stenstrom yelled through the calm. Your mother is ready to die of worry. He was sitting in his large office aboard the Caroline, and he looked positively livid. This is very irresponsible of you, Bell. I'm, I'm sorry, Father. I'm simply doing what Mother has told me to do, to be my old man. If she wouldn't continually harass me with black maidens and soul devourers, maybe I'd be in touch more often. Captain Stenstrom squinted and tried to look past his face at his surroundings through the screen, noting the faded paint and streaks of rust. Are you in a brig somewhere? Is that a mask you're wearing? This is my office. It's not much, but it's mine, and I am wearing a mask to keep Mother's demons from tearing apart my soul. Your mother has done no such thing. Your mother loves you. Captain Stenstrom's interest seemed to peak. His anger diminished. So, where are you? Are you on a ship? A fleet ship? You can tell me. 
I am on a frigate. A frigate, he said with some distaste. Yes, it's a fine frigate, and I am its paymaster. A paymaster? You're the paymaster of a frigate? That is correct. Mother never thought of knifing a shipboard civilian out of me. I've always wanted to join the fleet. Father, to soar the stars like you do, I, I suppose this is as close as I am able to get. You never showed any interest in joining the fleet. I always wanted to join the fleet. Father, Lyra too. I wore the clothes you sent home to me, and I played with the toys you bought for us. Mother wouldn't have it. So here I am, a fleet paymaster on a rusty old frigate. It's not much, and it's not how I expected it to be, but I am living my dream. Captain Stenstrom, despite himself being smiling from ear to ear. Well, what do you know? You are something, my son. You've got some wit. What ship are you on? Maybe I can swing by if I'm close. I'm... I'm very proud. I'm very proud indeed. I'm on the Sandwich, 15th Fleet, I think. A again, it's not much, but it's home. The places I've been to, the things I've seen. Remarkable. The captain noted the name down. Is there anything you need? Just say the word and I'll get you whatever you require. I'm fine, Father. Well, I must admit, this is a great surprise, the sandwich, and my son is its paymaster. But still, as to my previous point, when you're close, I do bad you come home and visit your mother. She... she what? Nothing. She would love to see you, is all, and your sisters too. You will be happy to learn that Virginia is betrothed. Well, that's wonderful. To whom? Lord Cobblesham of Pole. She's very excited, and as usual, your mother is home fussing over the details. How about Lyra? She's actually planning on going to school. She managed to talk your mother into letting her go. Can you believe that? Stenstrom was quite nearly open mouthed with shock. Well, that's. That's amazing. What school? What is she studying? University of Arden, and she's studying stellar cartography. Your mother is mellowing, and Lyra attending school is the proof. I cannot believe she would conjure up demons to harass you. Come home, Belle. Tell her what you've become, and I promise she'll be as proud of you as I am. The sandwich made birth in Mercia several days later to load up on supplies. Stenstrom and Callie disembarked. He promised to take her out on the town. As they walked down the gangplank, he felt his protective holy stones go off, jangling in his coat pocket. He stopped and scanned the area. What? Callie asked. Well, something's about. He cleared his coat and put his hand on his end. Howie looked around. Demons? Do you think? Possibly. He looked around and didn't see the usual black-robed figure sniffing about. Instead, he saw a familiar shape standing on the dock. He smiled. Hey, Akali, I'm going to have to take a rain check. I promise I'll take you out tomorrow, okay? What? What is it? She asked. Who are you ditching me for? I see a friend down there. I promise I'll get you tomorrow. All right. Tomorrow then. I wish you carried a holomon or something so I can get hold of you. Watch out for demons, okay? Callie gave him a wink and trotted down the gangplank and disappeared into the streets. Stenstrom slowly walked down to the dock. A familiar person stood there waiting for him. Hello, Lily, he said. Hello, Belle. She replied, spinning her usual parasol. I heard you would be in town here in Mercia, and I wanted to see you. He took her hand and kissed it. It's been quite a while, Lily. Where have you been? Oh, here and there. Come on, Bill, take my hand and let's enjoy the afternoon. Together, they strolled into the city.
I tell you, Lily, it was wondrous wearing Dunks' coat. I know, I know, it's just a coat, but it felt so good wearing it. I felt safe. I felt whole. I felt like I was part of something. They were sitting at a cafe on the water's edge. His holy stone was rumbling constantly, but he saw no demons and felt no particular danger. He could feel his ints at his side with fresh cinnabar strikers just in case he needed them, and that was a comfort, at least. Lily finished her lunch. Oh, you young lords and your love of uniforms and pageantry. She gazed at him hard. You look good in a mask, I must say. You have the face for it. He closed his eyes. The things I have to do to overcome my mother's effort, I can't take it off or else I feel my soul ripping apart. Even ashore I feel it. I'm not safe anywhere I go. Callie suggested branding the Hermelins within into my forehead, but I really didn't want to do that. And who is Callie? Oh, she's a friend. I see. Lily appeared to flush for a moment. She grit her teeth and then moved on from the subject. So you enjoy wearing a fleet coat? She said, reverting to the previous subject. I did. And you enjoyed it because it made you feel like you were part of something? You reveled in the comfort of wearing a uniform? Well, I suppose. Well, perhaps you might wear something similar, something that looks like a fleet ensemble, but actually isn't. There's nothing to stop you from doing that, is there? Stenstrom finished his lunch. Well, no, but... Well, no buts, Belle, Lily said, dabbing her lips with her napkin. Come with me. Let's go shopping. Shopping for what? Your uniform, Belle. Together they plunged into the lovely city and prowled the many shops lining the streets. Lily looked him over with a discriminating eye, not unlike his mother's. I think you shall need a white shirt, a pair of dashing black pants, knee breeches if you must, and a new sash. Do you have any particular color in mind? Well, green is the designated color of a fleet paymaster. Well, all right. We'll get you a lovely green sash. The pants and the shirts were easy enough. His pants were simply black cotton pantaloons that they bought in a nice tailoring shop along with several white shirts. Lily insisted on a frilly shirt, though Stenstrom resisted at first. She also tried to get him to buy a different pair of boots, but he refused, having a love of his old metal Tyrol boots. They moved on to a fine haberdashery. They looked at the assortment of men's hats, concentrating on Vith triangle hats, as they most resembled those worn in the fleet. Lily picked him out a large black one, inlaid with silver swirls. Now for his coat. That was the hard part. They looked all over, trying to find a coat that was similar to the long-tailed coat worn in the fleet, but wasn't overly garish or mocking. And that was a tall order. All of the tailors they went to had nothing like what he wanted. Too overblown, too simple, too dainty, too modest, too costume-like. Most of the coats they found that were cut in the fleet style were for going to the opera or a night at the ball. Lily finally had the answer. She pulled him down a side street, the fine shops fading to a run-down rustic facilities and steamy workmanlike warehouses. Stenstrom looked around dubiously. What could they possibly find there? At the end of the street was a large bustling warehouse selling used and damaged goods at a discount to those encumbered with a more meager budget. Let's look in there, Lily said, pulling on him. Stenstrom didn't want to go in. What could they possibly have in there, Lily? It's a thrift store offering nothing but used sundries. Oh, come now. What could it hurt? We've had no success at the more prestigious establishments. Sometimes one can find a lost or hidden treasure in a second-hand store. Stenstrom stopped. I really don't want to, Lily. Please, she cooed. For me? He sighed and took her hand. Together they went in. 
The warehouse was vast, offering boxed and unboxed articles of clothing, shoes, stockings, undergarments, old pieces of furniture, and the like. None of it was displayed with any regard for presentation or aesthetics. Everything was laid out, no frills, and functional. Nothing more. They rolled around the vast aisles, sorting through this and that. The other shoppers in the warehouse were dressed rather poorly and gave the richly attired Stenstrom and Lily reproachful looks. What did they need in an establishment like this? Stenstrom half-heartedly looked at the used wares on display. Well, shockingly, I'm not seeing anything that I like. Well, I don't think you're trying. May we go? Lily pointed to a corner of the warehouse they hadn't checked yet. Let's look over there first, then we can leave. They walked to the far side of the warehouse. The items on display there were a bit more expensive than the goods laid out elsewhere and got little attention from the usual shoppers. The boxes laid out on the tables all were stamped Hoban. Stenstrom looked into the boxes. Hoban turned out some fine items and he was mildly impressed by what he saw. Bell, Lily said from behind. What about this? He turned around. Lily was holding up a long, dark green coat. It was so long it dragged on the floor in front of her. Stenstrom took it from her and held it up. It was a fairly heavy coat made of tourmaline, a fine fabric made from the hair of a livestock animal native to Hoban, the finished product mixing the feel of silk with the toughness of wool. The entire surface of the coat was embroidered in twisting ivy, highlighted in silver thread, mixing in lightning bolts and some sort of fruit-like objects. The stiff black collar and cuffs were heavily embroidered in silver and gold. It had silver buttons and silver clips. Centered on both sides of the collar, riveted in place, were the letters HRN in gothic flawless silver. He stood there holding the coat. It was the loveliest thing he'd ever seen. What do you think, Belle? I think it's a wonderful coat. He continued to gaze at it. Try it on. See how it feels. Stenstrom put the coat on and it fit almost perfectly. The sleeves were just the right length and the tails were just an inch or two from dragging on the floor. It was almost like it was made just for him. The tourmaline fabric breathed well, so the coat wasn't too hot or too cold on him, and it had numerous pockets sewn into the interior, perfect places to put his holy stones, marzible, his astral plane detectors, and other bits of arcane equipment. He imagined a coat like this could serve as a mobile office, housing everything he'd need. Oh yes, Belle, this looks wonderful on you. Look how handsome. How does it feel? Well, it feels nice. Lily backed up a few steps. Yes, it's elegant and fleet worthy, yet not too overdone as to appear like a costume. From a step or two away, you almost look like an admiral. He was sold. He checked around and didn't see any other coats like this HRN one and bought it as is. As they left the warehouse wearing his HRN coat, he felt like a new man. He felt like he was bursting with power. It was getting late and the sandwich was soon to blast off. Stenstrom and Lily made their way back to the docks. As they did, Lily's demeanor seemed to change a little. She looked lost. Desperate even. Worse, she looked positively sad. He asked her what was wrong. Nothing. I suppose it's getting late, and my job is done uh, uh, for the day. I, I'm glad we found clothing to your liking. They arrived at the docks, and Stenstrom gave her a kiss on the hand, as there were many people about. Lily's usual cool demeanor completely fell away. She whipped bitterly. Her mouth pulled back in anguish. <laughs> Oh, Lily, Lily, what's wrong? She looked at him with her tear-streaked face. I love you, Belle, she said, putting her arms around him. I love you so much. Don't ever let anyone tell you that I don't love you. Don't ever let anyone tell you that 
what I feel isn't genuine. He was a bit shocked by this display of emotion Lily had been so standoffish of as of late. Oh, I love you too, Lily. I, I've been around, I've experienced life, and I've not met your equal. Truly, I want you, Lily, I want to make you my countess, the first of the Belmont South Tyrol line. I want it now more than ever. I've learned a lot in these two years, and I've learned that there is no other but you. Flushed, she managed to smile. She put her hands on his face. I've, I've plans to make. I've steps to put in place. I, I don't know when you'll see me again, Belle, but I promise you will. As I have tried to impress upon you, there's always a way around a challenge. If you want something badly enough. Lily, your tone has a certain air of finality. It's frightening me. She dried her tears and smiled. Don't be scared, Belle. There's nothing to be scared of. They kissed one last time and slowly, Stenstrom mounted the gangplank and walked into the ship. As he turned, the door closed, expecting Lily to be gone. Wafted away like she normally did. But she was still standing there on the dock, her hands to her face, her parasol lying on the planks. Blasting off from Mercia was terribly emotional. Lily was still standing there crying as the ship lifted away, hands on the boat deck glass. He watched Lily's weeping form quickly fade into a speck and then gone. He felt such a tide of loss. Returning to his quarters, he fretted for a while. Lily was strange and rather odd toward the end of the day. He thought for a moment that she was going to break it off and cut ties with him for good. He was sure of it, but something had prevented her at the last moment. He would parted ways with Lily many times, but this one seemed different. It seemed like the end. He got her locket out and opened it, seeing her smiling, hand-painted face. There was a knock at his door. Come in. The door creaked open and there was Callie, carrying a few bags from her day in the city. Hey, Belle, did you have fun today? I almost didn't make it back aboard. I, I had to run. He didn't say anything. He stood, grabbed her, and kissed her hard. She spun around. Her bags went flying, and he threw her on the bed, her legs going up in the air as he closed the door. Oh... She said in a sultry voice as she popped off her shoes and began unbuttoning her pants. Okay, okay, that's how you want it. Come and take it. He was sick of feeling out of control. His whole life, his mother, Lily, the sisters, Lady Miranda, even Alatrix. At every turn, there was a woman in his way, tripping him up, confusing him, and making him hurt, and plunging knives into his chest, ending his dreams. Tonight, just for once, he was going to take out all his frustrations on a woman, and Callie, ever eager to try new things, appeared to be more than willing to play along. With the locket open, Lily watching, he tore into Callie. They sat at breakfast the next morning. Stenstrom was wearing his new gear. Callie, I'm, I'm really sorry about last night. Why? Callie said, smiling. I thought it was fun. Not a sight of you I see often, though we might have to sit out tonight. I'm a little sore, you know? He gave a short laugh and continued eating his breakfast. I like your new clothes, she said, looking at him. I went shopping with Lily. She was waiting for me on the docks as we departed the ship. I didn't see anybody on the docks with you yesterday. How do you mean? Why, I didn't see anybody. I looked around. I, th I thought I saw you walking off with a, a mannequin or something. And I was thinking, hey, if he's going to off and have fun with a sex mannequin or something, I want to join in. But I couldn't haul him on you. Stenstrom laughed. Th that wasn't a mannequin. That was Lily. Okay, if you say so. Callie looked at his clothes. You look like an admiral or something close to it. I've only seen a couple of admirals. They, they make me sort of nervous. Yes, I found this coat in a second-hand store of all places. Can you believe that? A, a beautiful coat like this? I wonder what HRN stands for. Oh, that's easy. Hoban 
Royal Navy. Stenstrom was surprised. The Hoban Royal Navy? Do you know it? Well, yeah. I might be stuck on this old tub, but I'm still a crewman in the fleet. Everybody joining the fleet has to pass a fleet history course right off the bat. And there was this whole chapter on the Hoban Royal Navy. The fleet hated the Hoban Royal Navy. Stenstrom was curious. Tell me. Well, I don't re remember that chapter too much. I, I, I think they were just a bunch of guys from Hoban. Obviously, uh, sort of uh, like you, uh, rich, uh, highly placed. They, I think they tried to replace the fleet around Hoban a few years back. Said they could do a better job of protecting Hoban from the Zaffins and that the fleet could. According to the course, they were actually there to protect the governor of Hoban. And he was a incognito pirate, I think, running contraband to the Zaffins and raiding passing ships. I guess they didn't last too long. I think they lost the only battle they ever got into with the Zaffins and had to have the fleet come and rescue them. How about that? I think a lot of them got killed. And some were thrown in jail for gross incompetence. And maybe a few got executed, I think. But they wore coats just like that. I'm, I'm really not surprised you found that coat in a secondhand store as they're all washed up and outlawed now. Seeing it up close, it's a really neat looking coat. The morning bell tolled. Well, there's my cue, Callie said, standing. Time to go to the bridge and stare into the little visor for a while. She put her tray into the trash and then leaned down and whispered into his ear, Hey, I know your lady must have troubled you yesterday, somehow. I know you were hurting, and I'm glad I could have been there to help, to take your mind off things, you know? You're my friend, Belle, never forget that. If your lady broke your heart or chose to discard you or something, she must be crazy. You're a wonderful man in every way. Thanks, Callie. She gave him a quick peck on the cheek and headed off to the bridge. He returned to his office and checked his mailings. There wasn't much. His duties were minuscule at best. He looked up the Hoban Royal Navy on his terminal. As he read, Callie appeared to have summed up their history quite well. The governor of Hoban, a Lord Crow, had gotten into a tiff with the fleet over a bit of contraband goods that had been seized. Apparently the governor had a little streak of pirate in him and was enraged that the fleet had busted up his ring. He then forbade the fleet from approaching Hoban, instead forming a small navy of old Planetfall corvettes and calling it the Hoban Royal Navy. He was quite proud of it at first and even thought that such a thing would become a trend, each local planet having its own small navy to protect against the Zaffins. Perhaps the fleet was no longer needed. The navy proved to be a disaster. Sloppy standards, dubious morals and motivations, ships in worn out shape and barely space worthy. The fleet had to come and save them from breakdowns time and time again. The only battle they ever fought with the Zaffins at two pitch nebula was a complete rout. The great Zaffin hero Princess Marleth of Xandar was for once victorious in battle driving the HRN corvettes before her until the fleet came and covered their retreat. Soon, red-faced, the Hoban Royal Navy was disbanded and the governor sought to hide all traces of their existence. He scrapped the ships, threw several officers into prison and sent the uniforms off to be burned. All trace of the HRN was made to vanish almost overnight. Not quite everything, this lovely coat, made with care and fine material, still stood, and Stenstrom would wear it with pride. And with that, we conclude Part 2, Chapter 26, the HRN. So there you have it. That's where Stenstrom's HRN coat came from, from a secondhand store at a warehouse in the wharf city of Mercia. Stenstrom... Goes out on the town with his betrothed Lily, or his, he hoped, betrothed Lily. Mentions how he enjoyed wearing Dunks' coat. She has the idea, well, let's get you your own fighting uniform. It doesn't, you know, it can be something that looks like a fleet uniform, but actually isn't. And I think that would, that would work well. 
So they get him some shirts, some pants, a hat, a green sash as he wears going forward. And in a secondhand store, the HRN. And there's a lot of things to the HRN, as you find out in future books. It was almost like it was put there intentionally just for him. Huh. Lily then, though she seemed her usual kind of standoffish way, towards the end of the day, seemed to break down and insinuated that this was it, that her relationship with him was over or had come to an end or she had served her purpose and that seemed to bother her quite a bit and Stenstrom was concerned why are you crying and she told him you know this this is it and you know and I I love you and that don't let anyone tell you what I feel isn't real and he's like okay and then they depart feeling pretty rotten he takes out his frustrations on the ever willing Callie, who I guess is game to have a night of rough sex. So that's that. That's where his Hoban Royal Navy coat came from. His fighting ensemble is now complete. So next week, chapter 27, Incident at Terabus. This is a long one. This is quite a long chapter. How long is it? It's about almost 20 pages. So this is going to be a, a slog, but it's, it's a good chapter and a lot of important things happen. And just so you know, this chapter created one of the most severe gut checks I've ever had to endure in my literary career. This chapter here, and we'll find out more about that next week. So until then, this is Ren Presents, and I am your host, Ren. Peace out.